afternoon. It's a real honor to be here today. Congratulations uh, to the organizers. It's uh, spectacular. And uh, I think uh, uh, from a diplomatic perspective, to, to see the, the vitality of uh, uh, climate change, uh, renewable energies, uh, uh, diplomacy is, is very impressive. I think uh, uh, this is a very important part of the future uh, story of, of diplomacy that is being written uh, uh, today here in Abu Dhabi. We have short time, a uh, lot of questions, uh, and I'm sure also the audience will want to uh, uh, post questions. Uh, so, uh, since everyone here has uh, the bios of uh, participants, uh, I suggest we go straight uh, uh, to a conversation. Please uh, keep short uh, your answers and try to interact as much as uh, you can. Uh, uh, we are in the dialogue hall, so uh, no monologues uh, here. But let us start uh, discussing a little bit uh, your own strategies. Tell us more about your countries, uh, uh, not only in terms of what you are doing internally, but also how you are projecting your uh, plans uh, uh, in the international arena. Um, let me start with Minister uh, Suhail Musri, uh, the host uh, uh, today. Minister, your plans is, are very ambitious. Uh, you are doing well. 2021, 27% uh, renewable energy, if I'm not wrong. Uh, by 2050, 50% uh, uh, production of renewable energy. This is very impressive. How is it going? Uh, uh, what uh, your challenges are and how you are projecting these internationally? Thank you. and. Uh I'm delighted to be uh, to be in, in this panel and uh, welcome everyone to uh, the Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week. Uh, our uh, targets for 2020 would be uh, 25 uh, clean energy and we categorize nuclear as part of the clean energy. UAE uh, have uh, engaged with uh, the ministry have engaged with all stakeholders uh, among them one of the leaders here uh, his excellency uh, Saeed uh, Tayer and, uh, uh, and our target was to come up with a plan and direction. Where are we going? And I think we, we, uh, we looked at uh, different parameters and we elected to go 50% clean energy by 2050. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be 44% renewable and around 6% nuclear. And the rest is going to be fossil based. And the fossil base is, is primarily gas and we have, uh, we have clean coal as well. But every five years we are going to revise those, those, those numbers based on uh, the commerciality of, of those projects. The, 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 uh, they will need to, to compete on affordability, they need to compete on, on sustainability, and they need to compete on uh, security of supply as well. So we have the direction. I don't think it's very, it is ambitious, but this is the future, and UAE have, have proven to deliver on, on what they say, and I'm confident that the directionally we are going in the right direction and we can achieve it. Thank you. Uh, Adnan Amin, uh, Director General of IRENA, uh, the uh, key international coordinator in the key uh, international organization uh, for renewable energy. You are almost a local uh, too, uh, and uh, um, I think uh, uh, when we uh, read about the challenges and, and the ambitions uh, um, and, and we see all these efforts uh, in the context of investment and what it requires from the point of view of the international community, uh, international law, agreements, uh, uh, conferences, and, and then trying uh, to imagine that with all these challenges, uh, the world will continue uh, to grow and will continue to uh, uh, keep uh, the, the, the plan that in a few decades it will be prosperous and habitable for everyone. Uh, 
how can we do this? What is, uh, 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 what good news uh, you uh, can give us after the last uh, IRENA conference? Well, thank you, Bernardino, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. I think uh, optimism is in the air. Uh, and I think that uh, what we're seeing, you know, the traditional problem with diplomacy is diplomacy has de been deployed traditionally in situations of scarcity or competition or conflict. Uh, we now have a new type of energy diplomacy, which is a de energy diplomacy at a time of opportunity and potential abundance. And what does that mean for international cooperation? We've just finished a three-day assembly, and uh, there are some remarkable things that we are seeing, trends at the global level that are potentially transformative. One is that uh, the technology involved in low carbon or renewable energy technologies, cost reductions have been dramatic in the last decade. Uh, we are now, and, and you know, the UAE is a prime example of this. Uh, Saeed al Tahir is sitting here very modest, modestly, but he's the owner of some of the world records in power generation with storage from concentrated solar at 7.9 cents a kilowatt hour. We're seeing regularly in the region power being generated from uh, uh, PV at 3 cents a kilowatt hour or below. Uh, when we get to these kind of levels, then it becomes an issue of what is the logical choice for investment in power generation for the future. Looking at all the cost range of all renewable energy technologies, we've developed a costing database, 15,000 utility scale projects we sample every year around the world, which shows that every renewable technology is going to be cost competitive with any conventional power within the next decade. Now, in this kind of situation, the transformation of the power sector is virtually uh, done. Uh, so Hale mentions often that it's going to be cost competitiveness that determines the energy mix in the future, and he's absolutely right. But on the basis of that cost, competitive, com cost competitiveness, we're seeing uh, the perspective for investment in renewables growing hugely globally. The second is that investment is not a problem. There is a consensus among everybody in the energy sector that there is a huge amount of liquidity in the international financial system. The challenge for us is how do we create the bankability of projects and how do we create the kind of financial mechanisms that we need that can deliver capital two projects in the time that we need. So that's another very positive. But the third, which is really the fact that more and more countries believe that we are in the middle of a transformation of electricity systems, of energy systems, that's going to be fundamental to economies and societies in future. And you can see reflections of that already here. Uh, once again, here, uh, the movement towards, preparation of movement towards electromobility the integration of electric vehicles in the grid as a component of the energy system, rooftop solar decentralized uh, uh, electricity and the, f the ability through the smart grid to manage this. This is going to be the shape of the future of electricity and energy. And I think that what we are seeing in terms of uh, the speed of the transition is that it has reached now third gear and soon will be in fourth gear. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Abdul Hussain Ali Misra, um, Bahrain is, uh, has special challenges determined by uh, geography, um, but has also very ambitious plans. Um, as Minister of uh, Electricity and Water uh, in your country, uh, you are probably the best placed one to uh, let us know about what are uh, the plans, how is Bahrain uh, uh, envisaging to overcome the challenges? And also, I think uh, very especially in your case, uh, uh, we would like to hear more about the GCC interconnection. How is it going? What the perspectives are? Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as you said, Bahrain is a small island, and we have limited size of land. However, we have a national uh, sustainable energy uh, strategy for the future. The challenges we face, like I said, we have limited size of land, we have limited resources of fossil fuel, 
And also, we have no uh, rivers or waterfalls. So we had to be very selective in the type of strategy that we use. The strategy we use for sustainability, one of them is the GCC electricity network. We are looking at sustainability overall. So for example, for us, we were relying on gas for generating electricity and water before almost 100% but we have limited resources of gas. So how we are going to sustain our requirements for the future? We said that we will uh, diversify the source of energy as a first uh, stage, which gives us an alternative source, especially now that the cost per kilowatt hour of renewable energy has really come down. And we hear different figures, uh, 1.96. And I hear in Mexico, they have offered 1.69. Now, that is tremendous if, uh, if that is true. That's 1 cent, 0.69 per kilowatt hour. It's something unbelievable that could have happened before. So for us, we have uh, created a center for sustainable energy. We call it Sustainable Energy Center with two main aims. One of them is to encourage investment in renewable energy, and the other aim is to uh, conserve and improve the, uh, uh, the efficiency of the energy that we have. And for this purpose, we have prepared two national plans. One of them is called National Energy Efficiency Action Plan, NIEF. It's about 50 pages. It spills out what we need to do to achieve a national target, which is 6% more efficiency. We, in the REAP, which is National Renewable Energy Action Plan, which is also 50 pages, we have spilled out what needs to be done to achieve our modest targets for renewable energy. We have a, a target of 5% by 2025 and 10% by 2035. And because uh, the limitation of the land, we have to be creative in how we are going to uh, you make use of solar and wind energy. So we did a wind map for Bahrain. We know now which areas there is wind prevalent enough to have the velocity. Also, we have uh, done on the renewable side, we are concentrating on solar, wind, and waste to energy. And for that purpose, we, have, uh, we are working with the Uni United Nations Development Program experts to develop this. So we have made a big strides. Uh, we, we, last week, two weeks ago, the government of Bahrain approved the net metering policy where all the uh, residents and citizens in Bahrain can have uh, solar on their rooftops and generate their own renewable energy. This is breaking monopoly. Before two weeks ago, nobody in Bahrain could produce and sell electricity except the government of Bahrain. So for the first time, there is a breakthrough. And whatever surplus they have in renewable energy generating electricity, they can push it back through the same meter to the national grid. So this is one. We are now, for us, the size is small, but uh, we are working on a 100 megawatt solar farm, and we will be going, going out to tender next month. And that, the, for that, the land has allocated land for us. The other creative thing that we are doing, we surveyed all the number of schools we have, all the hospitals, all the government buildings, how much space we have on the roof. And we are going to install solar on these. So all these things, we want to have sustainability because Bahrain uh, was maybe the first country to discover oil in 1932, but we are running out and it's going down, so we have to come with new strategy. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh, this yeah. is what we need. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Said Mohammed Al Tayer, uh, Managing <laughs> Director and CEO of uh, Dubai uh, Electricity and Water uh, Authority. Uh, Dubai is known uh, as one of the 
cities leading in, in the world in, in renewable energies. Every week we read something about a new initiative or a new project. Uh, uh, Unimpressive numbers, uh, uh, 20, more than 26 uh, billion in projects uh, uh, for the next year. Um, you have been involved uh, personally in all these projects uh, for a long time, especially I know in efficiency, uh, reliability uh, projects. Uh, what can you tell us about your experience in Dubai so far and uh, how you see the prospects in the near future? Thank you very much. Uh, actually, we have a very ambitious plan. By uh, 2050, we'll have 75% from renewable, mainly solar and uh, BV technology. <laughs> For the coming year, up to 2030, we'll have 40,000 megawatt solar, consists of BV and CSB, mainly the BV. And also we have very also ambitious plan with respect of curbing the demand down. And we have about 30% by 2030. And this requires actually many initiatives and many program, uh, especially as you know that in our country, most of the load go towards uh, cooling. Therefore, we have a district cooling uh, initiative. We have also, uh, we are putting a green fund in order to encourage people to retrofit their building. We done a study that more than 30,000 30, buildings we need to retrofit. Uh, we need to reduce the waste and improve the efficiency of the building by 40%. We already done for the last two years 2,000 2, buildings. And the remaining is about over 28,000 buildings. I think we'd like to be a role model in energy efficiency, and this is the main thing. As you mentioned, with respect to the reliability and uh, uh, the availability of our power plant, I think we are one of the best in the world with respect of the customer minute loss. Today, we have, we break the record actually for customer minute loss. Last year, it was uh, the year before, it was 3.3 minutes. This year, we reduced it to 2.6, and this is the lowest worldwide. Line loss, we are also the lowest worldwide, about 3.3%. And also efficiency, we have three mega project. Each project efficiency is about 90%. So we are not only building new plant, but also we are curbing the demand down, improving the efficiency. Also, we have a abatement strategy to reduce emissions by 2016%. Uh, 20, More than 9% will come from Dubai Electricity and Water Authority, the power plant. The remaining will come from the aluminum smelter and also the mobility. I think this is aligned with our strategy to be more innovative and sustainable in the future. And for the next five years, we budgeted for investment about 80 billion dirham. Thank you very much. Uh, Nick Bridge, uh, with a long trajectory, is uh, all our uh, guests uh, know in, in the Treasury and the Foreign Office uh, on international development. Uh, but uh, let me start asking you about the UK. Uh, you were telling us before that uh, you had uh, already last year's uh, a few days uh, uh, in which uh, you didn't use any coal in, in producing energy. We know that also the plans uh, on reduction, uh, reaching 80% as, as 
uh, you have, uh, the government has decided recently are extremely ambitious. Uh, tell us a bit more about uh, these uh, experience, uh, please. Um, and tell us also about the uh, renewable mix uh, in the UK in general. Uh, like uh, all uh, these gentlemen, uh, I'm very close to renewable energy uh, because uh, my wife worked uh, uh, in Iberdrola, so she was uh, working with Scottish Power, and I know that some of the biggest uh, uh, wind projects uh, in the world uh, are in uh, the UK. Uh, so tell us please more about uh, your experience. Thank you. Well, first, a huge thanks to our hosts, His Excellency. This is a remarkable gathering, and I'm privileged to be on this discussion, and uh, it's incredibly impressive what's happening in the region and the targets that are being set. Um, yeah, you mentioned, um, uh, that's right, last year there were days in the UK when we had zero coal in our energy uh, electricity production for the first time since 1882. So the most interesting bit about that story is that we had 40% coal in our electricity production just five years ago. So when people talk about things taking a long time to shift and transition, we have evidence of this happening incredibly quickly. And of course, the other side of this coin, it primarily is uh, in addition to a strong nuclear and gas uh, strategies, is the renewable story. You'll see that uh, I'm wearing my renewable offshore wind socks. <laughs> Such is the fame of the UK offshore wind story, or even now manufacturing socks with offshore wind turbines on them. This story has just been fantastic. In the last two years, the offshore wind auction price has halved from over 120 pounds per kilowatt hour per megawatt hour to 57 pounds per megawatt hour. And I was telling some colleagues uh, uh, about, uh, it used to be weeks and weeks to put the um, offshore wind uh, tower into the sea and they're now doing it in 12 hours. So those are the productivity gains, those are the efficiency gains in these new industries, these new sectors. So we're now the biggest producer of offshore wind in the world from last five, six or seven years because I think of this incredible innovation in, in, in industry, the incredible commitment including from our hosts to invest in that market and uh, what we hope is a smart regulatory market-based set of instruments, good auctions, a little bit of grant to help with the big upfront cost and then very low marginal costs as the renewable energy is, gets in place. So that's been a fantastic story, I think, on, um, on the offshore wind. Going back a step further, uh, I commend these you know, very interesting, the review, the five-year review, which is obviously now embedded in the Paris Agreement. The stars are really aligned now globally. You know, we have the Paris Agreement decarbonizing the global economy by 2050. We have the Sustainable Development Goals committing to this more holistic cleaning up of the environment and doing that in, in line with uh, development goals at the same time. And at the same time, over on the economic side, in the market side, People are ready for the reasons we've heard around the cost and the unit cost. People are ready to move. So our offshore wind is now coming in at cheaper than new gas and nuclear uh, in, in the UK in a very short time. So as Adnan says, this is very quickly actually moving beyond the power sector into an economy-wide conversation around electrification of transport, um, the um, decarbonization of our infrastructure, and now we've got a lot of work to do in the UK on power, on, on, on uh, buildings, on heating, on transport, on industry, and taking carbon out there uh, as well. Um, we've gone down in our uh, emissions over 40% since 1990. So that's more than halfway to the 2050 target. Um, the economy is decarbonizing, but at the same time, we're still a very big manufacturer, but more into advanced manufacturing now. So I think we're proof that, you know, that 40% reduction in emissions has come in a period when the economy has grown around 70% cumulatively since 1990. So we really believe that um, this is the only direction, irreversible in terms of political commitment, irreversible in terms of market signals. Um, 
the nice thing now about some of the technologies is we are hosting a very big summit later this year on uh, low emissions vehicles in the UK, a global summit to which all of you are invited. Uh, and, 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 and some of the exciting um, things about that agenda are that the battery technology for the vehicles has many crossovers into the battery technology for energy storage. And so we have now got up to 50% renewables on our grid without the problem of, uh, without the problem of, uh, of, of, of secure supply. So that's the beginnings of a, what I think is a, an exciting story for us. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Almirza, uh, we didn't uh, uh, discuss before the uh, interconnection, uh, uh, the GCC uh, interconnection, which uh, in the case of Bahrain, uh, I think is, is particularly important, though uh, diplomats know very well, and we have today with us also a group of uh, Emirates Diplomatic Academy students, and they know very well that no country is an island, and interconnections uh, uh, are today very important from the point of view of investments, uh, infrastructures, uh, uh, markets. Uh. So I would like to ask, uh, uh, from the point of view of Bahrain, but also from uh, the UAE and Dubai, how this uh, interconnection uh, um, in the GCC, uh, um, what the perspectives are uh, in the near future and in the long run? Well, the interconnection is actually in place uh, the first uh, four countries which were connected was in July 2009. They were Bahrain, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Kuwait. UAE joined in uh, 2011, then later Oman joined. So now all the six countries are connected. The first phase of the interconnection uh, was concentrating on emergency needs requirements. For example, if any one of the six countries during the summer or whenever they need extra electricity, there is an authority which is run jointly by all the six countries, will make sure that that country that needs it will get that. And that has avoided lots of blackouts maybe in, in all the six GCC countries. And we have a statistics which show that this was a major, major improvement in the blackouts in the GCC countries. The next phase, the second phase, is the trading phase. And this is where if a country has surplus electricity, instead of keeping it idle, he can sell it through the same infrastructure, same network, Pre to a country which needs it. Pre precisely, uh, Minister al Masrui was telling us uh, uh, a few yeah. minutes ago about uh, that aspect. Uh, yeah. And uh, you, maybe I just add one thing. You said, how does it help us in sustainability? Uh, like I said, our gas resources are limited and we have been depending on gas. So now with the GCC electricity grid, if one of the countries has surplus electricity, we import that electricity into Bahrain through the grid and uh, that gas which we were using to generate electricity will save for a strategic purpose and sustainability. I think, uh, like His Excellency mentioned, this is a critical infrastructure that is now, fortunately, is used in a commercial way. But we are just at the tip of the iceberg of the potential of the exchange of power. Uh, in UAE, we are working very hard with everyone to start an energy market. And we believe that with the modernization and the, uh, the uh, cheaper uh, forms of, uh, sustain of, of renewable energy, uh, PV solar, we will be able to cut the cost down in the future and de-risk the fluctuation of the gas prices. And we think that UAE can and will uh, supply others with uh, with a re reasonable uh, and cost-effective uh, energy. So there is a potential for expanding it today. I think the exchange, the norm of exchanges, is is around one uh, one gigawatt. But I think once we tap into the interesting projects that uh, His Excellency uh, Saeed Al-Tahir mentioned, 
40 gigawatt uh, is 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 to be installed from now until or, or more from now until 2050. Once we are there, I think, and Saudi Arabia is doing projects, Bahrain is considering, Kuwait, everyone will have so many gigawatts of renewable energy. I think the region is with the linkage with Egypt, we can even send power to the West and power up Africa in the future. So the potential is huge. I think the, the, uh, the, uh, what we are trying to do is we are trying to remove all forms of subsidy from the gas to any forms of, of electricity. And we are trying to, to also work in the ministry together with ADNOC to ensure that we have sufficient new gas for everyone within the Emirates. And this is to us is, is a priority. And I think with the efficiency improvements and the turbines that we are seeing and the future generations to come, we believe that we can achieve self-sufficiency in 2030 and beyond. So this is the target and we think we can achieve it. Mm. Dr. Altair, I think uh, as Dubai is a global city, you must be watching the region, but also watching beyond uh, the region. Yeah, I think what you see in the future, that in the past, you, what, what was the utility role in the past, it will not be the utility role in the future. You will see more artificial intelligence, you will see more digital, uh, for example, this digital uh, uh, and, and artificial intelligence will improve the efficiency and uh, uh, trying also to improve the, the, the operation cost of the authority uh, by better prediction of the future and try to optimize more in unit commitment. For example, uh, th there are in the future will be more challenges, especially when you have more uh, BV uh, or you will have different type of uh, technology and also different source. So how you're going to maximize and optimize and uh, try to do the best optimal uh, curve with respect of utilization of different resources. S therefore, you need machine, uh, for example, what you call it uh, artificial intelligence, where they can calculate and predict the trading. Uh, you will have more trading differently, you will, but you need to reinforce also the external network. You need to enforce the 400 uh, KV uh, connection with, uh, not only as uh, His Excellency mentioned, with the GCC country, but also with uh, Africa, with Egypt, with, uh, with Europe. Uh, this is very important, I think. Uh, however, the existing network, the existing grid, it is added value, it makes the system very robust. There is no interruption, there is no outage. Definitely it's improved, but we need to go forward for trading. This is the next step, I think. Thank you very much. We are getting close to the end, so uh, very uh, briefly, um, I would like to ask uh, uh, Nick uh, on, on a couple of words on, on a wider, couple of words on a wider perspective from the UK, the European integration, the European uh, market. Uh, from the energy point of view, I think there's no Brexit. These connections are there and, and co will continue to be there. And Adnan, uh, IRENA is a global organization. Uh, it's not a regional one. How global can integration in renewable energy become? Uh, I know these are not easy questions for uh, one minute, minute and a half each, but please try. Well, very quickly, just, just building on the discussion on interconnection, we have a series of uh, regional initiatives that are now underway. Uh, we've developed an idea called the uh, Clean Energy Corridor concept, which has now been ruled out in East and Southern Africa. Uh, in West Africa, we have endorsement by heads of state in Africa of this idea. In Central America, uh, in Southeast Europe, 
and now we're looking at ASEAN. The idea is how do you develop an integrated, well-regulated market for renewable electricity in these countries because renewable electricity becomes cheaper with scale. And I think that this has had a tremendous impact in the thinking of energy planners across these regions because the availability of uh, resource potential in all of these areas is tremendous, whether it's geothermal or solar or uh, uh, hydro or uh, wind. And uh, the real problem has been bundling projects to scale, creating a market for finance that uh, we can uh, create securitized instruments that can finance investments and creating a stable regulatory market where investors feel comfort with the, with the type of uh, environment they're working in. And I think this is really going to be much more of the future because everything that we have seen in terms of the future of electricity based on renewables has to do with interconnection. The fact that you have transmission system operators in Europe with 50, 60 percent renewables in their system who are managing it, you know, like Said said, without any outage, without any interruption, is because they have interconnections between markets. They can source hydro when they need. They can go to other markets. They can source gas. And that gives stability. So interconnection is a great driver also for collaboration. And as a diplomat, you know this. <laughs> Thank you. The, Thank just to reinforce, yeah, we have four interconnectors. They've played a key role for the UK and for Europe um, as we move towards the greater single market in energy. So very important. Um, and it really balances the system very well. Um, I mean, two other very big picture points in closing, I, I, I'd just like to say. One, all of this is, is great for our economies, um, but we you know, really also have this incredible climate change imperative. That, you know, we, we're doing amazing things, but the science is increasingly alarming, so it's, it's fantastic, but we need to go faster. So I really think that these gatherings are very important for maintaining that uh, momentum. And the second big picture thing we haven't got time to talk about, but I just want to register, is on the greening of the financial system. The money is out there, but it needs to dramatically transition because all of these projections we're talking about are infrastructure projects in the next 10 years. And that's the decision envelope we've got to completely switch our system. So London will try and play that role as much as it can in greening its um, systems. And I encourage and other, other centers to cooperate with us on that. Thank you very much. I don't know if we have the time uh, for to take one question. Uh, someone from the organization uh, can tell us, or, or we have to, to finish. I take the silence as a positive answer. So maybe we can take one question from uh, the audience. Uh, yes, the gentleman there. I know him. He's one of the students from the Diplomatic Academy. Let's try to keep the question and the answer very briefly because the President of the General Assembly is coming next. Yes. Your Excellencies, uh, thank you for this uh, valuable uh, session. My name is Amr Attaneji, student at uh, Emirates Diplomatic Academy. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, promoting energy uh, for youth. Uh, we heard uh, in the previous uh, session about uh, promoting youth in UAE here. The UAE has leading in uh, promoting youth in education and in, we, we have that uh, privilege to have education and to have uh, uh, more promoting the UAE's uh, energy to the globe. So I need to know the uh, future plans for this uh, 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 interconnection between UAE's GCC and the globe, how to promote those uh, energy uh, transformation to the sustainable uh, the energy uh, for uh, formatting uh, for youth uh, exactly in each and every uh, uh, single place in the world. Thank you. I think the best promotion for what we are trying to do now is commercializing the model to the, to the international pricing uh, standards. And I think the pricing that we are getting here in the region, where we have the gas, so the, uh, the gas is within the system, and it's not, it's not necessarily got to be an LNG, 
So we can, we can tap into a pipeline gas. So that makes the price of gas as, as one form of the energy cheap. Combining that with an affordable renewable energy will, makes, will make the mix, I think, very affordable. And I think that is how we market and commercialize what the success that we have here in the region to sell it up to uh, Europe. The quality of the sun rays that we have it here is great. And I think it's doable. We just need the upscaling and we need the policy and we are working here to generate those, those policies. So I am, I am personally optimistic that we will get there uh, sooner than what, uh, what we think. I'm afraid we will not have the time to wrap up. So let's uh, leave it there with this optimistic and, and positive uh, message. Gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been very interesting, very informative, and very brief. Thanks. Thank you.